Michael McCarthy, thank you for coming. It's so nice to see you in Clarence House. I've just read your wonderful book, The Moth Snowstorm, which I really loved, and I wanted to talk to you about it and also ask you questions in connection with my own book, A Restored Earth, Ten Paths to a Hopeful Future. Yes, well, good morning, Edward. Good morning to you, and thank you for coming in. How are you? I'm fine. Good. I'm fine. Good, um, good. I'm very happy to talk about um, the uh, seem sometimes seemingly insuperable difficulties of the problems which we face. Indeed so. Nicely put. And what's so striking about your book, which I've been recommending to friends and which I very much hope gains a wide readership here and across the pond and elsewhere, is that it's, it's very movingly personal about the loss of nature and about the challenges that we face. And I, I'd love you to describe a bit more about it for those who haven't yet read it. Well, I would say, in its essence, it's, it's attempt, an attempt at mounting a new defence of the natural world which is mortally threatened. And in the last generation, in the last perhaps 40 to 50 years, we started to realise the scale of the threats against the national world, uh, the natural world. And we've developed uh, two <coughs> um, inter intellectually based defences for, 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 for our threatened nature. And the first was the idea of sustainable development highly relevant here, of course, because here we are in the Prince's own sustainability unit. Um, and really that was, uh, you, you will know the history of it, it was brought forward by Groharl and Brooklyn's report in 1987. Uh, and at the Earth Summit in uh, 1992, which I reported for the Times, hmm. um, it, it, it seemed for a moment, for, for a, one of those hopeful moments, like in the French Revolution when they decided they would start the calendar again and they would start time from a new beginning, uh, that, that, that this theory put into practice could save the world. And, and an enormous work programme called Agenda 21 was drawn, was drawn up. Uh, if everybody had adhered to which, it might be possible to slow down. Uh, the, the terrible destruction of natural systems that we were witnessing. The difficulty with sustainable development, and I think it has failed, is, is that it relies on fallible human beings to change their behaviour, and human beings don't necessarily do that. It accurately diagnoses the problem, uh, and it accurately pr provides a potential solution, as, problem, as long as people, and by extension governments, will change what they're doing and sometimes refrain from the bad things that they're doing. But it is clear that they will not necessarily do that. So a second defence has come along, which you, uh, Edward, will also be intimately familiar with, which is the recognition of the worth of ecosystem services, which is something that's happened in the last 20 years. We've realised that natural systems provide vital services for us that for hundreds of thousands of years we've taken for granted, so we never realised that they were there, but we can't do without them. And this recognition, the most obvious one being the pollination of crops by, by bees and other insects, um, it has been a marvellous step forward. But the difficulty with sustainable uh, with, with ecosystem services is that it's highly selective. And what ecosystem services does is it affords worth generally speaking, to those natural systems which provide services for us upon which a monetary value can be placed. The difficulty is, if you're an environmental economist and you can't put, put a monetary value on it, do you accord it any worth whatsoever? And perhaps you don't, because you could say that coral reefs are worth $500 billion a year, and you can say that rainforests are worth $17 trillion a year, and people can do these calculations but how much is birdsong worth? How much are butterflies worth? And if they have no notional monetizable worth, are they then to be valueless? So the trouble with your system services is it's highly selective. And what I wanted to do with this book was to try a third way, as Bill Clinton <laughs> was it, used yes. to say, um, and that was to go back to what the natural world means for our souls and our emotions and, and our psyches and base a defence upon that. 
Thank you, Michael. That's very clear. And you do that very beautifully, if I may say, in the book and describe what it has meant to you. And it's often very moving and it's, it's very beautifully written. Our good friend, Tony Juniper. Yes, indeed. A great man. A great man. <laughs> would say that human beings can work with these multiple frames simultaneously. They can be presented with the arguments for sustainable development, for ecosystem services and the economics thereof and for the love of the natural world. And, and we need multiple different ways of winning the argument on the environment. Um, so I think he would say he would profoundly agree and share your love of the natural world, but that the ecosystem services approach is of some value in trying to win the argument internationally. I think you also say that in the book. Yes, I, I think so. Really, I've done it the way I've done it because it's a question of emphasis. Uh, I mean, lots of people are talking about sustainable development Lots of people are talking about ecosystem services, but very few people, as far as I can see, are talking about what, what I believe to be the case, that we have a natural bond with the natural world inherent in us, and if we destroy it, we're destroying part of ourselves. So while I do recognise that sustainable development has made a real difference, and the difference it has made is that it has meant that for governments and large corporations and the environment must be taken into account which wasn't there before even though uh, uh, I, I recognize the value of it and I wholly recognize the value of ecosystem services uh, my emphasis it has been to say that there are weaknesses in both of them and that is why another approach is needed so of course they have value but they're not the complete answer thank you in my book, or my hoped-for book, I'm trying to make the argument that we can still turn things round, and despite all the challenges of the 21st century in terms of climate change and in terms of biodiversity loss and in terms of conflict and all the other challenges of our time, nevertheless it's within our power somehow to put things on a better track, and we should try. And in part this is in my more optimistic moments because I do believe this, but it's also in part because I think it enables people to act and if people feel that we're all effectively we've lost the battle to protect the environment then a kind of nihilism kicks in where and no one wishes to act further i may well be wrong about this but i wanted to ask for your view on you know are you optimistic about the future are you profoundly sad well, about the future? well i wrote a valedictory piece when i resigned from the independent after 15 years as an environment editor um, and the essence of it was that I thought that man would destroy the earth. Hello, come in. Hello, Sorry, John. I'm looking for Lucy. Oh, I think she's upstairs. Okay. Oh. Um, mm. I said I thought we would destroy the earth, but at least the Green campaigners would be able to say that they'd been there and they'd fought. Mm. Um, <laughs> and that, that didn't exactly go viral, but it was immediately retweeted about 600 times. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, isn't it? Because this book takes a slightly different tone. Uh, this book does not say that. Mm -hmm. This book encourages, it, it seeks for a way to pe for people to fight. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it says that perhaps an awful lot could be done. As mm -hmm. penultimate paragraph says, because ordinary people's feelings are the beginnings of political will. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, <laughs> if you remember what um, Emerson so famously said, you say I contradict myself very well, I contradict myself, I am large, I contain multitudes. I think part of me thinks that we, we will destroy the earth, at least we will destroy the natural systems. So we won't destroy the rocks and the sea, but we will do something terrible to it. Um, because I can't see how you can stop the things that are going forward unless by major catastrophes like nuclear war. But part of me thinks it doesn't in any way want such a recognition as that that I may have to stop me fighting for it. Because I think that, um, and, I, and I, I've heard this argument that if you say, uh, look, we can't stop it, then people will give up. Well, maybe people will, but I don't feel like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's good to be realistic. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you're not realistic, you don't get the scale of the problem. Mm 
Mm. And, you know, in, <laughs> as, a, as somebody who's been writing about the environment for 30 years, for major national newspapers, I have learned that it is, it's always better and safer to overestimate the dangers rather than underestimate mm. them. Because they are terrible. Because if you, if you look at... I mean, the great elephant in the room, of course, is population. And I don't think in the book I used the word because I didn't want to go down that road, but I used the phrase, the scale of the human enterprise, which is impossible. Okay. Um, one of the great truths of the last 20 years has been this feeling, and you've referred to it in your own prologue, I think, uh, that now we, we have 7.2, 7.3, whatever it is, billion, we're going to hit... 9 billion by 2050, uh, and then it's going to stabilise. Well, in the summer of 2015, there was a new paper out from one of the UN's key population figures, which said that this may be wrong, and we may go on to 12 billion by the, the turn of the century. So all bets are off. But as somebody like Jonathan Porritt will say, and a, a bit of a you know, voice in the wilderness, pop, all population increased time after time after time after time, all it does is it, ra it ratchets up the pressure on everything. And especially if, it, it, in mid-century, it, it, what, what population pressure may do, it may combine with the effects of climate change. The two things may coalesce in, into an impossible pressure. And, um, you know... Yeah. If, if you spend a long time looking at that, you cannot but be very pessimistic. But on the other hand, you know, I, I still want to uh, stop it. And, you know, I've written, I suppose, what would be my contribution and my version of it. But the way you are doing it, which is looking for policy prescriptions, I wholly support that. I think, let's do it. Um, but certainly it's a big problem. Certainly, Michael, and that, that's very, very clear. And it's hard to imagine how things will play out in the decades ahead. And one can imagine a, a utopian vision, but one can also imagine a deeply dystopian one. Yes. And, and to some extent, power dependencies are already in train, but at the same time, there's a lot we could do to shape the future. And that is and that is clear, but a lot is already in train. Well, just to say, there's one thing that does give me hope, and that's the idea of rewilding. Mm -hmm. This this new version of conservation, and <laughs> rewilding has been so monstrous, mon monstrously portrayed mm. that people uh, tend to think. Certainly, and it, unfortunately, it has to be in the right wing press. Why it should be a political left or right thing, I've no idea. But mm. anyway, there it is. But basically. What we're going to do is uh, put wolves back in the home counties. We're going to do it. It's all about apex predators, and it isn't at all. What all that rewilding means is that at the moment we are in conservation means we are keeping what we have got. Rewilding means a different form of conservation, which is putting back something of what we have lost, and that gives me great hope because um, uh, we have lost just in our own small country. We've lost more than half our wildlife in my lifetime. And it is clear that, that if you make serious efforts, you can put things back. Like we can put back the cell buntings in Cornwall. You know, mm. The first ever reintroduction of a songbird. Um, the avocets are famous, the sea eagles in Scotland. Um, and so, um, but there are some things that are very hard to put, put back. And one of the things this book is concerned about, and I I've talked about in an interview on the Yale website mm. today, and also I've written a piece in British Wildlife about it, mm. is the thing in which the public has no interest whatsoever, which is the decline of invertebrates, mm. which is terrifying, because it's very hard to measure, but it's clear that it's enormous. And as E.O. Wilson, the Harvard mm. biologist, said, invertebrates are the little things that run the world, mm. principally insects. And restoring... We have 24,500 insect species in Britain, and the vast majority of them are not monitored, so we cannot know how far they are going down. Um, 
some of them are barely named, like some of the parasitoid wasps. So um, putting back uh, keystone species is one thing. Putting back your charismatic megafauna, mm -hmm. even your charismatic mini fauna, like the soil bunting, mm -hmm. but replacing, halting the decline of invertebrates after 50 years of pesticides drenching our land is going to be a very, very difficult, if not impossible, problem. Thank you. And, and it has been fascinating to watch the rewilding debate yeah. and to see some of the work that's being done here, yeah. but also internationally. I wanted to ask you about the writing of the book. As I said earlier, it's very beautifully written. It's also very personal, as um, material in it about your family. And I wanted to ask a bit more about what it was like to write and thoughts and advice, really, for an aspiring writer on, on, on the tone and the content and the style of the book. Well, I, I think one thing I suppose I would have to say is that you know, I've been a professional writer earning my living by writing every day mm. uh, for more than 45 years. Mm. So, uh, you know, just at its simplest level, part of that is, is just you know, my stock in trade, my skill to sell. Mm. Uh, I mean, other people do, I mean, other people are wonderful bird watchers, other people are great fishermen or whatever, but the thing I do is writing. Mm. So, um, I think I, like any professional writer or professional journalist, I suppose what I start with is from is, is knowing what isn't any good. Mm -hmm. So you have a slight advantage in that perhaps you, know, you write a sentence and you sort of, you, you, you generally, although not always, but you generally know that's rubbish before, <laughs> before it gets to the stage of being shown to anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all write rubbish. Mm. You know, we all go down avenues, and mm. sometimes these avenues are very fruitful, mm. and sometimes they are entire cul-de-sacs, mm. and it's knowing the difference between mm. them. Um, I mean, uh, I like to think that in this particular book, that there is a, a neatly constructed balance between the personal and the uh, and and the general. Although I like to think that you can't see the join, as it were. Mm. I mean, the book is carefully constructed. Mm. It has a story, which is the story of what happened to my mother uh, and what its effects were on me, not only in uh, early childhood, but also the resonance of them into midlife. And if you look at the structure of the book, the book is bookended with this story. Mm. It opens with it and it nearly closes with it. And mm. that is, um, that is uh, an, an entirely intentional. That's the way it was designed. Um, you have to be careful with your own personal experience because I think it has to, you have to have a sense of an address to the reader and will the reader be interested in this because it's very easy to be self-indulgent and, you know, everybody's favourite subject is themselves mm. uh, we all like writing about ourselves but um, if you can if you can make it relevant then I think it's worth doing uh, I think that's what I would say thank you that's good advice I, yeah, I've been reflecting on that in the context of my own life in the recent weeks because my wife and I are expecting our first child and oh. this is a, a, a recent uh, development um, and it's at the early stages of the pregnancy. Where do you live? Uh, we live in North West London. Where about? Uh, Wilsdon Green. Oh yeah, I yes. know Wilsdon Green very well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so my thoughts are sharpened by the sense of what's the world responsibility. What is the world into which this world? child will be born? That's right. And so I feel that in my, the book that I'm trying to write it would be relevant to make some reference to this but at the same time perhaps to avoid talking about it too much um, it's also a very intimate thing of course um, but nevertheless it's um, it, it is it, it has already sh shaped my feelings and my thoughts about the subject that we're both engaged in what is the unique selling point of your book well in the a preface and in the material that I prepared to date, I think it's the optimism. I, I feel that, as we, as we described, that I do feel we could still put things on a better track. I, I feel that human intelligence and uh, our understanding of our predicament is incredibly sharp and clear. 
it's very, very hard to turn things around, and we've all witnessed how difficult it is over the last few years, or in your case, over the last 40 years, to put things on a better course. Nevertheless, I do feel that 2015, as I mentioned in my material, was a turning point. I feel Paris Agreement was a major outcome. It was, yeah. Um, and I also feel that the SDGs, however imperfect, are also quite a major... It's better to have them than not have Better them. to have them than not. And so... In a sense, I feel it's a book which is saying, you know, we are in a really, really difficult situation. Nevertheless, the world appears to have woken up to what we need to do. And, and here are ten paths to a hopeful future. And the paths are effectively to address climate change through a major transformation of our energy systems in the first instance, but also to protect and restore forests, to do the right thing by the soil, to cherish fresh water, to protect biodiversity, to protect our oceans to transform the way we structure our cities. And there, as Nick Stern said to me the other day, you know, many of the world's cities are still to be built, so we could do it right. To reduce waste and have a circular economy, which is something the Prince of Wales is very thoughtful about, as he is on all of these things. And then there are two further paths. One is a sort of individual path, what we might all do on an individual basis, uh, which I think is important because our daily lives are linked to all of these big global issues. And then the final chapter is a sort of global path, which I... I foresee a, some kind of Marshall Plan for sustainable development or for the protection of the environment uh, or for a, a different uh, approach to how we structure human society and our relationship with the natural environment over the coming century. So it's not a policy book as such, but it wants to capture a lot of the good ideas out there which we're engaged with here. And that, that's the thinking. So the selling point, I think, is optimism. Um, but... Um, it's not a blind optimism, and I think the point you made earlier is, is very valid. We, have to, we can't pull the wool over our eyes. This is a very serious predicament we're in, and we need to be realistic too. If you have a... One of the key things, it seems to me, that, that may make such a, such a plan difficult, is the idea of governance, of global governance. Mm -hmm. um, national parks is a good example. Every country in the world has national parks. But in some of the poorer countries, national parks are simply lines on a map. And um, we, we learned, didn't we, with great shock about ten years ago that there were tiger reserves in India that didn't have tigers in and if you look at, for example, at Africa's national parks, it's something like in, in, the, in the Virunga National Park, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, something like 150 rangers have been killed in the, in the last 20 years since, the, Cong since the, uh, uh, the war of the Hutus and the Tutsis spilled mm -hmm. over and you got Africa's world war. If a country is too poor, if, you, if a country is too poor to equip its national parks with fences, wardens, uh, uh, how are you going to stop the wildlife in the national park disappearing if the people who either want to eat it or sell it or do away with it so they can mine for gold, if there is no agency which is capable of stopping them, how are you going to do that? I'm going to ask it. I'm yes, you. that's a good question. Well, clearly there are many paper parks in the world and it's, it's amazing how little funding most governments, including in developed countries, give to their protected areas. And as you say, the governance is often very weak with very few poorly equipped rangers often risking their lives, as you've seen, to protect their, those landscapes and the, that biodiversity. It wouldn't take much, I feel, to properly equip protected areas agencies, both in developing countries and in areas in the developed world. No, no, this is something different. To, to, okay. If you had an if you had if you had an international protected area agency. I never heard of this idea before, but it excites me. Hmm. If this was the agency that was multilaterally funded and this was the agency that went in to poor countries and provided the protection, that's a whole new ball game. The difficulty is where precisely 
the funding and the money goes because gov governance is right at the heart of how you do this. For example, in, in um, uh, uh, what was Robert Mugabe's country? Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe. Yes. They, had a, they had a wildlife protection scheme, I think it was called Campfire. And, the, and what, in Campfire, what, um, what happened was, to the, local, the wildlife was given to the local people and they could do what they wanted with it. But if they allowed 10 Texans to come in and shoot off all the bull elephants, they'd have nothing the next year. So there was, it could be a sustainable resource. But the way the money went, the money went through local government. And local government was corrupt. So that it didn't work. But in Namibia, they set up a, a wholly new organisation called Wildlife Conservancies. And these run in parallel with local government. And so the money went to the lowest level possible, which was the actual people who were looking after the wildlife. And they were given the wildlife. They found it. And, and so they got the funds from letting Texans shoot elephants. Uh, and they put that back into the community. The, the, the problem you've got with Africa, um, you probably got with Africa, is, 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 is a, a cultural problem. Uh, like the problem you've got with, with parts of the Middle East, and it's based on the tribe. And, and this has to be recognised, that in, in some parts of Africa, or some parts of the Middle East, you don't have an ethic of a, a nation-state ethic you still have a tribal ethic. So if you get a job in the bureaucracy, what you're going to do is use that job to benefit your immediate relatives uh, as to, to, uh, with every bit of your power, and you would feel that you would be crazy not to because everybody else is doing that. So you have a, a cultural problem with governance. So that's one of the things that has to be addressed. So if you were to set up a protected area agency, uh, that would be great. And donor nations could put huge sums in. We could put in 100 million for the DFID and think, this is a fantastic thing we're doing. But what you then have to work out is where in each individual case the money is actually going. Because a lot of the time it will be siphoned off. So... I think, you know, with something like, if we, as we go forward and we, we look at the, the megafauna of Africa and how we're going to protect that, uh, I mean, it's clear that, you know, the Kenyans have done it pretty well, the Tanzanians much less so, uh, the South Africans in some ways have done it, but it's, it's clear that it's not just finding the money, it's, it's, it's making sure the money goes to the right place. So... I, I, I think that the fact that, it's, and it's not only, you know, not only in Africa, it's, it's in many parts of the world, that you have a governance problem, which means that if you take somewhere like, well, if you take Asia, if you take Kalimantan, it's clear that the fires in Kalimantan this time last year, they were set by people who just wanted illegally to burn down native rainforests full of orangutans so they could set palm oil plantations. How do you stop them on that scale? It was clearly in the Indonesian government could. So, could, uh, couldn't. So, uh, uh, drawing, up, drawing up a plan to do it is one thing. But uh, the, Maurice Strong drew, drew up Agenda 21 in 1992, and he couldn't do it. So maybe, you know, uh, uh, something to look at. It is, yeah. Is a lesson, is to mm. investigate. Why did Agenda 21 not work, right? Thank you. You know, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's all, all, I'm just tr kicking Thank this you. around, no, I'm, you good. know, brainstorming, Thank are yes. we going to, hey, let's write a book. There's a chapter in that, and is there a lesson to be learned from that? Because mm. people have tried this before, you know. Yeah, they have. He, he set up, they set up a sustainability uh, uh, organisation, I can't remember the name of it now, but in the end, it, it didn't work. So, I certainly think that in, in, in many parts of the tropics, governance will be the make or break of whether or not 
we are able, especially with swelling populations who are hungrier and hungrier, so things like bushmeat. You know, Grower's Gorilla is now critically endangered. You probably saw that last week. Mm. Um, uh, why, why, why should you be a ranger if you you uh, can't get the petrol for the Land Rover? You've only got one rifle between three of you. Your boots are full of holes. Uh, and, and if you kill one rhino and get away with a horn, you're a rich man. So, I, 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 if I were doing what you were doing, because I think to some extent what, you, what you're doing has been done before. People mm. have, you know, done roadmaps. Mm. Okay. Mm. I, I'm just kicking this around. Please, yeah. very good. Yeah. I'd be tempted not to look at the ways forward. I'd be tempted to look at the difficulties. Mm -hmm. A book on the difficulties, right, mm. would be wholly different, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah? A book on how bloody terrible the difficulties <laughs> are, mm -hmm. but it would be different. Thank you. It's very good advice, and I'm taken by it. I wanted to respond on the Indonesia and, and other countries that you mentioned in the sense that I, where I loved your thesis in your book um, was, well I loved it in many ways, but one of the ones was that I really feel that in the long run, for example, if the people of central Kalimantan love their natural environment in the way that you and I love the natural environment with which we are intimately acquainted, they in time may be the sort of political citizens in their own polities that I think your penultimate paragraph of your book points to, and may themselves militate and argue for in the democratic context, assuming we hope greater democratic participatory democracies around the world for better protection of their natural environment. Just as in some instances where the conservation has worked well in sub-Saharan Africa and Kenya in particular, local communities have really bought into the conservation because they've seen that it has worked for them and been a benefit to them and the proceeds from conservation have been shared equitably. And so I feel the love of nature, the love of the natural environment, if it could be felt viscerally around the world in the way that you describe in the book, could be our best ally and I'm there very much with you there. Well, uh, I would say yeah, perhaps they might feel that as long as their other needs have been satisfied first. Sure, sure. Um, I, would, I would raise another difficulty, mm. you know, for your book of difficulty. Please. Right? Here's the next one. The next one is, not many people love the environment. Mm. Right? And that, for those of us who do, to realise that comes as a very great shock. Mm. Right? Um, because environmentalists are loud. Mm. They make themselves heard. Um, they, they, uh, they have a, a constituency into which they they can talk and get a ready hearing, especially in the liberal regimes of the West. But the people who actually care are a few, and they are much fewer than we think. And uh, I've just been reading. Better not say what it is because it's somebody's book, but it's about Asia, and it's about the experience of a bird watcher in Asia. And if you look at Japan and Korea, uh, I was astounded to read the accounts of Japan and Korea and, and how, f for it would seem, and I cannot say this from personal experience, I can only report what I've been reading, that the worth of the environment is not on the radar of one person in a thousand. Mm. Now, I think Britain is highly unusual, right? Mm. Very, very unusual. Even compared with France. The Ligue pour la protection des oiseaux mm. has 45,000 members. Mm. Right? Its direct equivalent, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, has 1.1 million members. Right? Mm. So, so in Britain, and in the Northern European countries as well, in, in Germany and the Netherlands and Denmark and the Scandinavian countries, there is a vivid awareness of the natural world, I think. Um, but in many other countries, uh, uh, most people don't care. So if I were doing, you know, if, this was chapter my, mm. two of my book, on, 
what these bloody problems are, <laughs> it would, it, the title of it would be No One Cares or even mm. No One Gives a Damn. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. An earlier iteration of the book proposal had the working title Why Should You Care? And I recall a discussion with one of the team at Unbanned, which went along the lines of, well, this is a very good title. And then my response was, well, it is a very good title, but perhaps everybody cares already, thereby falling into the trap that you described of assuming that everybody does care, when clearly a great many don't. Most, most people hmm. could not give a damn. Hmm. And what, that's one of the things I've tried to do in that book is to say that I believe and the, the, the discoveries of evolutionary biology are starting to show us that it is true that there is a link in our psyches to the natural mm. world mm. but it is covered up uh, I have said with 500 generations of farming and civilization, mm -hmm. and then what I also call the impenetrable mass of urban mental clutter mm -hmm. so even though it would be my it would be my contention that everybody is capable of loving the natural world mm. by no means everybody does mm. Mm. so well, you know I, I could get quite interested in a book like that <laughs> thank you michael i'll take your I mean, guidance what very would the, seriously what would the third one be then <laughs> governance well, is impossible nobody cares <laughs> uh, okay the scale of the problems would, would be another one wouldn't it mm. be, it'd be uh, 400 parts per million CO2. Yes, yes. And, popula and mm. population. You could write it. Look, no one's done this. Mm. Right? This, is, this would be new. <laughs> you could write it as... You could write eight chapters of impossibilities mm. and a ninth chapter about why you're going to carry mm. on fighting. Thank you. Um, just, it's just a thought. You know, it's a very good thought. Kicking it around. Thank you. Well, I, I, well, I do genuinely welcome it. And um, I will go back to my drawing board with this thinking well, in, in, in plain sight. Um, there are many difficulties, no question. The presence of the car internationally and its projected growth is another. Yes. And how to genuinely break away from that. So the stranded assets issue is another. What possible. is stranded assets? Um, stranded assets is the contention that we simply cannot burn the majority of the world's remaining fossil fuels yeah. and keep within our climate right. agreement and these assets therefore are at least hypothetically stranded and will be increasingly stranded as the international policy community gets sat together about climate change policy um, and yet in actual fact we know that already this year there are enough coal, oil and gas projects committed that would effectively take us beyond our climate target as agreed in Paris. So this is another devilish problem which I'm hoping to talk about in the book. But I think your framing is a good one and it's certainly an honest one, so, so thank you. I wanted to ask about um, the UK finally and uh, although in the book I won't write very much about the UK, I'm going to write a little bit about what Hugh Fernley Whistle and others have done on waste because I think that's one of many inspiring things that's being done here. There's a lot in every sphere. Uh, there's also a community solar project which I'm going to write about mm -hmm. with interest. Um, but I wanted to ask for your view about the current situation in the UK in terms of the love of nature and without being too political, your views on how we might navigate the new political landscape and what implications Brexit has for the future of agricultural and environmental policy in, in, the, in this country? Well, the first thing to say is, uh, on, the, on this basis, is that the European Union has many faults, you, and you can accuse it, of, accuse it of them. You can say it's a, uh, a club for rich businessmen, you can say it has an impossible democratic de deficit. You can say we, we need our sovereignty repatriated. You can say many things. But what you cannot deny is that over the last 40 years, it has built up a wonderful corpus of enlightened environmental law. And that the, Euro the, the environmental law of the European Union is the strongest protection we have for the natural world in the UK. Uh, if you are a Natura 2000 site, if you are a protected site under the Habitats Directive, or the birds directive, you are far more strongly protected than you are by any domestic protection designation in the UK from National Park down. So the principal worry for anyone who is concerned about the natural world in the UK uh, with regard to Brexit is are we to sacrifice this law because well, the previous co um, coalition administration, well in particular George Osborne, 
made moderately determined attempts to whittle down. He said they were gold-plated and they were ridiculous, ridiculously overprotected. Uh, the two nature directives, but of course it's not just the two nature directives. We have the bathing waters directive. We have a whole series of directives uh, which have given us clean water, clean sewage, and all, all, all the rest of it. So, um, as to uh, as to farming. As everybody knows, there is a once-in-a-generation chance to put farming on a completely different basis and say, well, here's your money, but for this, you've actually got to do this. But whether or not... Uh, the NFU does not want that. Um, and the NFU is a, is a very shrewd and powerful lobbying machine. Um, and farmers still have a lot of uh, natural sympathy just for farming. I mean... Prime example of it is the James Rebanks book um, mm. about a shepherd's life. A, a mm. shepherd's life. If you look at the Lake District, okay. So something I've started to realise, and I'm going to be talking about this with Fiona Reynolds in a in a the debate in Cambridge at the end of November, because she's written this book. The, this the, is a wonderful the, book. The fight, yeah, the fight of beauty. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I talked to her while she was writing yes. it. And, and, the beauty of a landscape is not the same as its wildlife riches, richness. And that is something that's taken me a long time to see. And I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not really dawned on the British public yet. But at a recent conference, I heard George Monbiot say, and I should have asked him for the reference for this, but I didn't, that Britain's national parks are so wildlife poor that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature had to invent a special designation to accommodate them. It's certainly the case that if you go to the Lake District, the landscape is, is inspiring. Of course it is. It, it's very beautiful. But if you look at the, the bottom of the top slopes or the top of the bottom slopes, if this was Slovenia or any part of Eastern Europe, what you would have there is wildflower meadows. You, you, you would have montane meadows full of wildlife. And in the Lake District, you've just got green grass because that's what the sheep eat. So it looks great, but it's the pauper. It, it is impoverished. So uh, I'm not quite sure why I got onto that because you wanted to ask about... Uh, no, no, you, went, you led there very logically from your assessment of Brexit being an opportunity to put things on it. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, OK, let, let us... Let us recognise what we really have in this country. I mean, you could see the moth snowstorm as one of, uh, as, as part of a river of work, and um, the RSPB organised state of nature is, is mm. an element in that river, mm. of recognising, and it's only in the past really five-ish years, of recognising how terrible the destruction of our native wildlife has been. Mm. So... If we were to have this, um, if we were to take a strategic look at what the future might be, and if we had to have this one-off opportunity of reorganising the way in which farming is funded by coming out of the European Union, let us look with clear eyes at, at what the state of our nature actually is. And the state is, it is terrible. So <laughs> let us not use any re-evaluation of how funding is done as a... A yeah, chance to do a certain amount of prettification, mm. let us use it to, uh, to, to repair in a, in, in a major way some of the terrible losses. The fact that the, fact that the Farm and Bird Index is 56% down on 1970 when they started properly counting it and it had been declining for 25% before that. So, you know, the farm, the, there's probably only a third of the farmland birds that were around when, when I was born. So if we're going to have this um, opportunity, uh, let's make addressing, let's make part of the addressing of the opportunity a true evaluation of where we are. And, and part of that is to be able to look at the Lake District and say, yes, it is beautiful, but it's got nothing in it. It's empty. And this puts one in mind of the current... On, uh, the, politics of the National Trust's view on potential 
moderate rewilding versus the Rebanksian view, effectively, of the perdurance of the landscape in its current form. That was a, that was that National Trust uh, was a very, as you rightly have spotted, that was mm. a significant move. Mm. Um, and back, uh, Rebanks, the book is well written, mm. very well written, very well written. Yeah. yeah, very moving. Mm. Uh, and it, it's um, you know it's the history of a tribe, if you like, isn't it? Mm. It's it's a history of a tribe, and you can see why if you grew up in the tribe, you would be completely, wholly taken with the, the culture of the tribe and with its with with, with its ceremonies and, and with its history and everything else. But that doesn't mean it's good for the natural world. So uh, yeah, I think we perhaps need more people to say some hard truths about places like the natural. I mean, if you, if you read Monbiot's Feral, mm. Monbiot went to Wales because Wales is mountains, he, Wales is hills, mm. inspiring, up there, alone. He went up on the hills and there was nothing there. Mm. Every five miles there was a crow. Mm. And the whole thing, everything had gone. So, you know, I mean, the prince goes to Transylvania. I've been to Transylvania. Transylvania, the wildlife riches are just staggering. Mm. And we see what the natural level of biodiversity is when it isn't swamped with pesticides. So, I mean, I could... Mm. Look, we've got a limited amount of time. And I can, very powerful. Well, well I can go on about this for all day long. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, it's been wonderful to talk to yeah, you. It really has. Yeah, interesting, and interesting. Um, you've spoken with great cogency and yeah, honesty yeah. and power, which is what the book does too. Yeah, so I thanks, yeah. was very inspired by it okay. and um, won't possibly be able to replicate it, but I well, will do uh, my never best to... Well, never replicate it. No, 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 yes. no, you should do what is yours and is uniquely yours. Well, I certainly want to be true to myself and I'm going to give it everything and, and see well, how it what, goes. What came out of Colombia? Well, I loved Colombia. I was there for three and a half years and I worked in the president's office and I was an advisor on climate change and biodiversity. The biggest thing for me was a commitment to protect the Amazon, and not just in Colombia, but across the whole Amazon biome. And I was very inspired there by what Colombia had done historically through protected areas and indigenous reserves, became very friend friendly with Martin von Hildebrand, the Colombian anthropologist who did so much in that area. Um, and so I've become a passionate advocate for the conservation of the Amazon rainforest and, and th for the protection of indigenous culture uh, through protected areas effectively in indigenous reserves uh, and good thinking about how to use, how to plan effectively nationally to protect the Amazon, all the Amazon. Um, but I also learned a lot about biodiversity because Colombia is still one of the world's most biodiverse countries by square kilometre. I think it is the world's largest, most biodiverse country and it's remarkable but there too the environment has been greatly decimated and it was sad to see um, but there too there has been much good work done. So I learned a lot there and um, it's informed my work ever since and when I came back from Colombia I joined the Prince's team and have worked here um, for the past five years to in carry Col In Colombia, what was the single most exciting thing that happened to you? That's a very good question. I, well I think possibly going to the Amazon, actually going to the heart of the Amazon for a week and um, tra travelling right through some of the most recondite areas of the Amazon. What was the single best thing? The single the most vivid experience of that week? Swimming in a river, possibly. Um, that was <laughs> Just because of the astonishing uh. experience of being in the heart of an Amazon river, effectively. Um, you know, in a distant village, many, many thousands of miles from where I lived in Bogotá. How did you come to love the natural world? I came to love, well I was always loved the natural world, I feel I always loved the natural world, and I grew up in London, but then I, I went to... Are you related to the end, David? I'm not, no, the, sec the much um, lamented Secretary of State, yes, yes he was very admirable, I think, um, is very admirable, uh, no I'm not, um, I grew up in London, but I have conservationists and environmentalists in the family, Anybody and I've heard of? Adrian Phillips, possibly, who oh, was at the, yes. the Countryside Commission, and... Uh, 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 yes, um, he, he, he owns the, uh, the estate in... Uh, uh, um, in Worcestershire, where I wrote a, an earlier book called um, Say Goodbye to the Cuckoo. Yes, which I'd love to read. Yes. And uh, there's a chapter in it about the spotted flycatcher. Right. Well, there's an, uh, there is an estate owner mentioned in that, and, and, and John, what's his name, the man who did the, the flycatcher survey, he, he is Adrian Phillips's 
wildlife advisor. Really? Right, yeah. right. Uh, so is he yes. a relative? He's my uncle, right. yes, Adrian. But I, uh, and also his wife Cassandra is a great expert on Wales. So they, they were among uh, the... Sorry, is that uh, Wales the country or... Uh, oh, sorry, Wales with an H. Right. Um, and, and worked for WWF for many years on, on whale conservation. But I don't know where I first fell in love with the natural world. Um, but I did. Maybe it was going to school in Brighton and the countryside there. Where were you school? In uh, Rottingdean, a village. Is that Lansing? Uh, no, it was um, St Albans. St Albans. <laughs> um, but uh, my parents are both very sensitive to the natural world as well. So, what did your dad do? Uh, my dad's now retired, but he, he did work in, in finance in the city. Um, and... Um, have you, got, have you got siblings? I've got siblings, yes. I've got a sister and three brothers. Ah, um, what do they do? Uh, well, um, the um, sister is now working for a bike project for refugees. Um, one of the brothers works in a vineyard in France, oh, um, which is lovely. Uh, and the other two work in London mm. in, in various things in the city. Um, and my wife is a community health nutritionist, and she's very knowledgeable and loves the natural world. Where, where do you live? Um, it's uh, northwest, northwest London. Oh, you said, yeah. you said, you, no, that's you, right. uh, yeah. sorry, you said. That's no, okay. Um, yeah. Have you thought about us addressing it? T taking each, each of those eight chapters, mm. and rather than them being, as it were, policy prescriptions, mm. in some way filtering them through your own experience. Well, I feel much more comfortable doing that in a way, and being. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to write the book in a more literary fashion, and I find your book very inspiring in that way too, than, than a, a dry policy book. I feel there's enough of that, as you said in our interview, and I feel what really captures the imagination is, is the soulful quality and the personal quality of the writing. And, uh, well, well, I just think that if you, if you take... OK, if one, I say one chapter's going to be in water, isn't it? Mm. OK. <laughs> one of the things I was taught as a young hack, <laughs> by an old hack, was, and I didn't quite see what he, he, he meant at first, and then I did, he said, write it as hard as you can. Mm. And what he meant by that was, you've got to strip away everything and get right to the heart of it. Mm. Okay, it's just very briefly, because mm. I know you've got to move on, but um, if you take the chapter on water, what mm. would be the essence of the chapter on water? That we need to protect and manage our water so much more sustainably than we do at the moment uh, and that would be to reform the way we build or don't build dams the way we use water for agriculture for cities and what case studies and examples have you got well on the dam question i wanted to talk about the namada dam in central india which i visited as an idealistic yeah. student in my 20s yeah. and about which i was very appalled at the time um, but I also want to talk about some other remarkable work in India with traditional water harvesters in Rajasthan oh. that I've never seen, the prince has seen, but I know the man who led it, Rajendra yeah. Singh, and I wanted to talk about what he's done. Because effectively he is encouraging in a landscape much more sustainable retention of water, and, and I believe that this example could potentially be scaled oh. elsewhere, and indeed has been. Could you not, in each case, do, rather than and do the policy prescription in the abstract, do it through the eyes of individuals that you yeah. have met. Yes. Do you not think that brings it, it alive? It, it does so much more, yes. I do want to do that, I really do. And and I can do it most on the Amazon, because I yeah. saw a lot of it, but I, I want to do it throughout, definitely. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, um, no, interesting. I mean, I could talk here yeah, all day, right. but, you know, well, it's, things it's, to do, place to go. No, right? dear Michael, well, thank you, really thank you. Yeah, well, and, no, thanks um, for... Uh, having me Thank you for coming in and You're all welcome. the best to you. And I well, look yes, forward to reading your other book too and yeah. all that you've written. Well, um, well not all of them. Well, so maybe perhaps we'll give it a, a bit more interest to know that you're included in that. Yes, Although it's not yes. me. Yes, okay. Um, but it's the, uh, it's the chapter on the spotted flycatcher and it's called, Thank you. It's called Understatement on a Fence Post. So <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Right. I will look it up. Thank you very okay. much, Michael. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All the best to you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, and listen, feel